Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. Uh, I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. The best satire on TV right now is by far Comedy Central's Corporate. Created by and starring our next guest, the show lampoons what it's like to live in a world controlled by, bombarded by, beaten down by corporations. The fictional media conglomerate that Matt Ingerbitson and Jake Wiseman have created perfectly and hilariously captures the mercilessness of now. Let's take a look. Matt used to think he was a natural beauty. Until this past week, no one had ever thought to tell him that he is, in fact, an uggo. However, with the power of makeup, I have managed to transform this pauper into a prince. <laughs> oh, makeup has given him a newfound confidence. We have forgiven his many intellectual and personal failings because, quite simply, he looks stunning. I believe that with a little convincing, we could not only get men to start wearing makeup, we could get them addicted and change the face of the beauty industry forever. Everybody, please welcome Jake Wiseman and Matt Ingerbitz in. Let's hear it. Hey. Hey, thanks so much for being here, guys. Uh, congratulations on season two. Thank you very much. Very much. Amazing. Um, when you made the first season of this show, which in my mind was one of the bleakest satires to hit TV in years, maybe that I had ever really seen, um, did you expect that, see, that you would get a season two? It felt to me like one of those shows that was kind of so radical in its tone that you were just sort of going for broke right away. Yeah, I don't think we ever expected to get a season one. So season two was definitely a surprise, and uh, we'll run with it as long as we can, but who knows? <laughs> this might sound weird, but I feel like when you're making a show, you should make it so crazy and exactly what you want to make that it'd be shocking if you got to do it again. Yeah. Because it's like, it feels insane to get a chance to make a TV show because it's just so much money and you're just some idiot. So it's like amazing to do it. And you're like, they're only going to give us this one chance before they figure out we're frauds. So let's go nuts. And that's it. We also live in this period of time right now where there is so much, so many shows. It doesn't make sense to just make something that looks like anything else because people have to kind of appointment viewing to look for you. You have to cut through. Unless you want to make a lot of money and be on network TV. You know what I mean? Unless you want to be really successful, I agree with you. Unless you just want to be background noise. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. uh, so going into season two, what were some rules that you guys set up for yourself or things that you were looking to do? Because so often with TV shows, whether they're as radical as this or not, when season two starts... The creators, the writers know each other, they know the cast, and it seems like they can move a little bit quicker and have sort of deeper jokes. Yeah, well, I feel like when you make a season of a TV show, you have no idea what you're doing. It's impossible to know what you're doing. It's a crazy amount of things that you have to learn how to do on the fly. So by the end of the first season, you go back and you watch it and you're like, oh, that's what the show is. I didn't realize that. We just made something and you're like, oh, this is what the show's about. These are who the characters are. And you kind of learn what the show is. And then season two, you're like, now I know who the characters are. Let's really build out who the characters are. Because I feel like even if you have all these philosophical and sociopolitical things you want to say with your TV show, most people are like, I love the character John. You know what I mean? That's what most people want. And so you have to write richer backstories and stories for the characters because well, that's what people want. I also think that like the audience has seen it now too so you don't have to, pilots are the worst thing in the fucking world to make because you have to have characters literally be like my name is this, and I used to do this, and now I'm this, so that anybody knows anything. Are you, what I want is this. Uh, my goal is to achieve this, and hopefully there aren't any obstacles in my way. Uh-oh, uh here, here comes all the obstacles. Um, you guys get it, right? Announcing who they are as an obstacle and where yeah. they've come from as well. Yeah. well. Let me say this. Some of you in the audience seem dead behind the eyes, yeah. and uh, I, I just want you to yeah. feel engaged, and I'm sorry you don't know who we are. We're not famous enough yet yeah. for you to get excited. I'll try to be funnier. We're trying our I hardest know you're to probably be famous. Getting paid to we do this or something. We blew to fucking New York yeah, to be famous. Yeah, but we want you to be happy, and it's yeah. not working yet. You know what I mean? And I, like, especially you, you seem very unhappy, we just want to make and I just want you to happy. feel good, and we're here for you, and we're talking to Ricky, but seriously, green, we want you to be happy. I bought green wool pants that are so itchy, and I wanted to look good for you guys. I like the green wool pants, though. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Does, it, does it feel to you, like, 
I mean, it is kind of a statement. Did it feel to you when you bought these wool pants that you were taking a risk? I knew that every person I encountered would talk to me about the wool pants. And Are you a person that enjoys that or a person that isn't? Because one time I bought a leather jacket and someone yeah. was like, nice leather jacket. And I was like, fuck you, because I thought they were making fun of me. I put myself as the star of a TV show. I'm a narcissist. I'll talk about my wool also, pants Also, Matt day. has yeah. this incredibly elegant, tall, beautiful body. So whatever he does is such a statement. You know what I mean? Because there's so much of this pant. You know what I mean? It's so much. Yeah. It's like twice the amount of pants <laughs> anyone else would wear. So it's like, wow, that's a statement. Yeah. So going into season two, after you guys had figured out what the show was, what was it like writing together? Did it feel easier? Did it feel like you could hit these things a little bit easier? I, I think it was both like... Although you'd been writing together for a long time yeah, prior to the show. It was easy in the, in the sense that when we get together, we're able to like put this show together. It like comes very naturally, but we didn't want to rest on our laurels and wanted to challenge ourselves and make it even better. So... Uh, and make each episode distinct and feel like a mini movie. So it's challenging in that sense to where, like, the storytelling of it, we try to never make it feel redundant like a uh, normal sitcom would, I think. The, yeah. the truth is that even though you get so much better every year that you write, I mean, you learn an almost infinite amount, it's still agony. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's like good agony because you have nice chairs and someone's probably getting you lunch. You know what I mean? And you have a cush job. But to create something that you like is always hard. Anything good that you've ever read or watched or listened to is the product of so much pain. You know what I mean? It just literally, it's all pain. That's yeah. everything that creates something good. So much so that this year in the writing process, Matt stabbed me five times with a knife. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But it helped us figure out an episode, so it's worth it. A stab for, like, each joke in the episode? Like... I don't know. I think he was just angry. Yeah, I got pissed off. Sometimes if he doesn't nap, he stabs me. I am. After this, I'm going to go take a nap. That's uh, what, what my day is. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, the episode that aired this week uh, was about social media and in a lot of ways the way that we um, memorialize people on social media, the way that we try to take part in conversations on social media, and we don't feel like we're connected if we don't take part in those. Um, social media, not to use those two words again, uh, has been lampooned already and people talk about it all the time. It's a hard thing to even have a casual conversation about because you feel lame immediately for talking about it. Mm -hmm. How scared were you guys going into writing that episode? How sure were you that you had found the angle that that would work and not feel that way because you do well i think it's like often uh the things that make us feel uncomfortable about ourselves are a good start writing or starting point for a writing process and so we in talking with our writers and, and engaging in this conversation about social media and like how you use it as a public tool in public discourse we all started we all had really weird feelings about it and it was uncomfortable and so we were like we should dig into this and see if there's something here. Yeah, I agree. I feel like a lot of good things to write about are things you kind of know you're hypocritical about. Yeah. So everyone's hypocritical because like the system is set up for you to have like disparate feelings about things. It's just confusing. And then if you're not all one thing, people are like, you're a hypocrite. So those are the things that are really rich for writing because those are things a lot of people feel. So the episode is about an unnamed tragedy and then the social media competition to see who grieves the most. And it's weird because when a horrible thing happens, a school shooting or Trump being elected, or uh, but not political, go Trump. You know what I mean? If that's your thing. No, don't, um, no. But if that's not your thing, don't go Trump. Don't if that's go not Trump. your thing, don't go Trump. No, oh, never go anyway, Trump. the point is, oh, you don't like him? No, oh, I, I thought you liked I him. I don't mean to be radical, but I don't, you don't like, like Donald him. Trump. Yeah. Oh, he's so liberal, though. Uh, but anyway, uh, the point is, when there's a horrible thing that happens, there's like this... <laughs> but he's so liberal, He's so though. liberal. He would be if that's what would get him elected, right? Yes. Anyway, the point is, if there's a horrible thing that happens, you, you like rush to the computer to be like, it's so horrible, you know, thoughts and prayers, because you feel like you need to talk about it, but then you're like, who am I talking to like the, none of the survivors or victims are reading this so then you feel bad for doing that but if you don't do something you're like i'm being silent in the face of a nightmare so it's this perfectly hypocritical situation or it's ripe for hypocrisy and you don't really know what to do and i feel like so much of being alive right now is not knowing what to do or how to act ethically and also effectively and that's just rich for writing about it and i feel like if your targets are the right thing and essentially our targets are us <laughs> and our actions you're you're getting closer to nailing it than not already yeah, so at the beginning of that episode where each char where all these characters are writing how they feel about the unnamed tragedy, I feel like I have been each of those people, especially your character, looking at the screeds of everybody and being like, you losers, you shouldn't be doing this. Like, Yeah, well, I've, I've been both. I've like typed up a nice thing and then been like, I'm an at, what the fuck am I talking about? And deleted it or posted it. It's like, 
Yeah, I think we've all been this person. And I think in that way, it's not meant to be judgmental or, or too harsh of an idea to put out there, but more just like, isn't it interesting that your grief is connected to the likes? It's like it is almost being monetized in this way by these companies. Yeah, and it's also yeah. just... You know, just the nightmare of capitalism is that, (laughs) yeah, Facebook makes money when a tragedy happens (laughs) because we're all posting on it, which increases ad sales. Mm. I don't know if that's correct, but it sounds right. (laughs) But the point is, is that it just feels insane. And also, when you're posting this stuff about horrific things happening in the world, you're, like, basically naked in boxers on your couch. And you're like, how am I helping anyone? I'm fully clothed at all times. Oh, you really? Yeah. Yeah, I wear a, I wear a chastity belt and uh, full. The yeah. second I get home, I'm nude within yeah. f- seconds. That's the old. That's the best part yeah. of home is like I step inside the door within 15 seconds. If I'm not nude, there's probably an intruder in the house or yeah. something that I have to deal with. I first. actually and then I'm nude after that. I take Jake care of that. Jake and I were roommates for years, and he gets unrobed so quick. It's a miracle. So, it, the door is open, and suddenly he's naked, and I don't know how it happens. I'm just really good at it. <laughs> Generally good at getting naked. Yeah. yeah. Like but I'm not good talent. at being naked in front of people because I have mild body dysmorphia, as I'm sure a lot of you do. It's a much bigger problem than we're willing to talk about, <laughs> especially among men. Women obviously have it. Men don't talk about it. We all hate our bodies. Our bodies are terrible. Except for my perfect body. My body's bad. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the reoccurring storylines uh, in the show is Matt, your character, is uh, always s- thinking that he's sort of better than the corporation that he works for, that he could achieve more, that he could be more individualistic and have his own personal freedom. Yet he always sort of succumbs or falls back into the safety of the corporation's enclosure, and you are always sort of pulling him into that. While you're criticizing corporations and capitalism, do you ever worry that that is actually a message of just sort of like succumb to the system, the system owns you? I don't think it's a message to like succumb, you know, like as if we're big brother, but uh, it obviously would, it's an obvious irony that we're making our show for Viacom. So we don't want to be hypocritical about the fact that we're making our money for this huge corporation. So it's just, it's just a thing you can't avoid. Like, you're part of a corporation. I don't know who bought you out, 100%. but the point is, like, someone owns you. And yeah. so we're all like, what am I going to do? Be off the grid and I not have any friends? I also think, in, in a larger sense, it's often representative of what it feels like to live in America, where it's right. like you can do everything you can to not be a bad person in America, but on some level, if you are benefiting from living in America, the actions of that country are often, <laughs> what we do are often horrific. And so you're profiting from that in some way and so it's uh it's just tough to live inside of that and so like off it you know succumbing to a corporation is one thing it's like they've already won it's like i don't want to like we don't want to never be too nihilistic but it's like kind of trying to recognize the problem we're in right now which is that we are trapped inside of this and there doesn't seem to be an easy escape but also, it's nice. I bought. I was able to buy wool pants right. because yeah, of. Uh, you want to be yeah. able to point out the problem without being naive. Yeah. Because otherwise, it's, it's pandering. And it's also the the sort of bombardment, not necess- or by people within the corporations, whether it's TV shows or books, that we can be better than who we are in that moment. We can always be, you know, we can be a chef or we can be something else that is better than just living. Yeah. And having like a copacetic, casual life. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think the character Matt often aspires to be something that is a little naive like he just i think it's more po- we're trying to poke at naivete within the system versus like actually trying to be aspirational or like starting your own business which is a good thing or like all these other i don't know well it's just yeah. so you know our real names are jake and matt and we mistakenly named our characters we jake never and matt. Shot, so now thought we this show would like, get made now i have to be like well the character jake which is as pretentious as it gets, i'm so sorry me, about so that. i'm sorry about that yeah. <laughs> That's I'm sorry about some other stuff if you want me to go through it. <laughs> Just yeah. the face, the personality, the general, uh, the bags under my eyes, <laughs> the really, even though I've had a lot of privilege, a lot of sadness. You know what I mean? Sorry about all that. Well, one of my favorite jokes that I heard recently was going back and looking at your stand-up and hearing one of your jokes was saying, my belt, I've gained some weight, my belt doesn't fit that well anymore around, around my, my neck. neck. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Suicide's funny. Let's talk about it. Uh, well, the better part of that joke was, is that a suicide or a masturbation joke? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, Keith Carradine. Keith? Which? Keith Carradine, R.I.P. Yeah. And and, Sarah, and Michael Hutchins as well, I believe. Oh, that's right, from NXS. Yeah. Yeah. Though it's sometimes difficult. It Do the they want to commit there. suicide or just have an orgasm? I don't know. It's hard to know. 
This is probably not what the audience wants. Um, <laughs> but I'm having fun. It's a little uncomfortable. That's kind of a fun moment you to live in. You pull in the dead out of their eyes. Yeah, I'm having fun. <laughs> Thank you guys for this experience. Uh, one of my favorite episodes uh, this season is the... Uh, um, uh, Matt's old friend coming in the concert. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like I have had that experience so much in my life where as a man in his 30s, I want so badly to go to some concert some night or to be young and stay out late and literally by 9 o'clock, I'm like, I wish I could be in bed watching TV. You look yes. great, by the way. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, just you said you were in 30s, you look wonderful. You're very handsome. He's a handsome guy. Thank you. I'm not disagreeing. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I think what Why we look? what Why we all look, realized though? is that <laughs> concerts aren't that fun. And so it's this lie that we've all been living, you know, because when you're young, you're like, I want to go to concerts. That would be amazing to go to a concert. And the older you get, your back hurts. Standing for more than five minutes is a nightmare. And so you're like, there is nothing better than being home and getting a good night's sleep. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, you go to a concert, you get tinnitus. Everyone's younger than you. You feel like you're going to die because you're like, I'm closer to death than these people. Yeah. And the music's not that good. Very few bands are good live you know what i mean and it's like it's just a nightmare just stay in enjoy your cat master but do whatever you drink chamomile tea do whatever you got to do it's better than chamomile. having fun chamomile no <laughs> it's not chamomile. i'm from new york i say things how i want to oh my god <laughs> is it chamomile or chamomile it's chamomile is it chamomile or chamomile that was a mixed bag. What the fuck is happening right now? <laughs> this is this blowing This is what my we mind. really need I to talk about. I have never heard it said chamomile once in my life. Um, did I just enter the fucking twilight zone? Is this... Chamomile. Who's chamomile? Thank you. I one, love you. One person. We should get married. <laughs> how did you guys meet? Because we had an argument about chamomile tea. <laughs> and that's how you find the people you really love. We met doing co in a basement doing comedy in L.A. Uh... It was just a random basement. We shouldn't have been there. Yeah. We both broke in. <laughs> there was no audience. We were doing comedy <laughs> in a basement. Yeah, I can't believe it worked out. We both yeah, broke into the same random mansion yeah. in Los Feliz. Yeah. And uh, it's like, I got to tell five minutes, and I'm bleeding. We did just do, we did do, we met in a basement, but we we once did, the weirdest show we ever did together was a friend of ours knew the lead singer of All American Rejects, <laughs> and he was having a wine and cheese party for like 20 people. This is what backyard. LA is like. We deserve to burn. Yeah. You know what I mean? We're just bad. Yeah, shoot us. Uh, <laughs> shoot us down. But um, their song? The... Uh, some unbelievable it was song like, uh, you definitely want to hear all fuck, the time. It's like in my head, but I can't sing it right now. It's, it's something la, like, la, he's da, a da, loser, da, da. or something like that. No, right? something. Yeah, basically da, da, that. Da, 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 she's do, a loser. Do, do, do. I'm making it up. I don't know. But, that but their, could hit, be their, their song. hit song, She's a Loser. <laughs> but he's like one of those beautiful yeah. androgynous lead singers, like in the line of Jagger and stuff like that, and Robert Plant, where you're like, yeah, you're beautiful. Uh, but anyway, you made a lot of money singing. You had a dope. wine and cheese party, and just because he's a powerful person, was like, I want stand up at my party. And so a, a friend of ours shuffled us in, and we did stand up at And a we fire will party. work for cheese. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like at that point, it went really well. Yeah. Yeah, and nothing came of audience. it, but I, met, I yeah. actually made a friend that night. Patrick Heisinger. Yeah, we made a friend that night. Yeah. So you guys met in a basement, not this basement, but when did you start writing together? When did it feel good to be writing well, together? Well, we did stand up a ton together. I mean, because stand up really bonds you because it, it is like, it's very difficult to like keep doing because it's so defeating and deflating and it feels insane to be like, I'm funny enough to entertain people with my word. Like, that's just a... If you think that, you're probably crazy. Like, that's not true. And so you have to do it so many times to get good, but we did so many open mics together and then so many shows together. Both of us were making sketches online because we always wanted to make TV shows and movies, and eventually we became roommates. It coalesced, and we started making things together. And, how, like, what was it? I'm sure you've written with other people. What was it about writing together that made it feel like it worked? It's kind of just like... It, was it, it just proximity? Um, I th it's not proximity because I think, I'll, you know, obviously all of you here have gone through relationships. Most of them haven't worked. Um, and uh, same for me. I, I've had so many breakups. Most of them shouldn't work. They don't. It's hard. When a good relationship works, they say, you know, we don't really question it. It just works. And I think a large part of it is that. It's like, it just works. We have a very similar sensibility. We complement each other well. And we don't fight about things. So I don't really want to think about it too much. because yeah, And I don't appreciate you asking. <laughs> Because it just works. It's, and so that's so lucky. Yeah, it is just as simple as when we hang out, we come up with ideas together. And that doesn't happen with everyone I hang and out I with. And I think we just yeah. have like an urgent need to create a lot of things before we die. I think that is like the real thing is like we just feel like we want to work. We want to create things where some people are not as crazed as us about making things. And I feel like there's a similarity there. It's like we want to make things. 
you know, I read an interview with you guys recently, I think it was in Vulture, where you said that uh, you're not just interested in making comedy, that you kind of want to make dramas together or something akin to dramas. Doesn't it sound so lame to be like, I want to make drama? You know what I, I mean? Know, it it really just does, sounds like, okay, who am I? Like, yeah. I just think that... Um, but it's not lame. I mean, our, you just have stories to tell. Yeah, it just sounds lame. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's just like our favorite movies and, and TV shows often start from a place of drama and are also funny. It, I, I hate things that are only comedy or only drama. Like, I think we just want to exist in a space where we can be both. And so we want to uh, eventually be able to make things that aren't, uh, even though we love Comedy Central, God bless Comedy Central, uh, I don't on a God. network called Comedy Central where it has to be a capital C comedy, we'd like to just be able to explore other and things. And also, just if you look at what life is, it's a drama with jokes. Like, it's a nightmare drama, and everything is so intense. And, like, it, you know, like, the second you're an adult, like, people are dying, and, and, and it's, like, scary, and you need to make rent, and it's very worrisome. But it's also hilarious. Like, the whole time, it's so funny, and there's all these, like, very dark jokes going on about your own life all the time. If you can have that... That macro view of it, I think it just reflects life more if it's somewhere in between. Uh, let's get some questions. Do we have any questions in our audience? We have one question. Who has it? Someone, you. Hi. Hi. Uh, I got a question actually from online for you guys. And Great. you talked a little bit about the writing, but I was curious about how you two go about grounding your performances in such a pointedly critical dark comedy like corporate. I just uh, think back to the times that I actually had jobs like this and my face immediately falls into the deep sadness that I lived in for many years. Um, I don't sleep, yeah. so I'm always miserable. Yeah. Like, I don't sleep at all, so if I have to tap yeah. into how bad I'm feeling, it's like, well, I feel bad right now, so well, I can I just start speaking. true? Are you an insomniac? Yeah. Look at the bags under my eyes. I'm 22. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> What's I don't sleep. How do you guys sleep? What's How do you not have, like, obsessive thoughts running through your head constantly? Like, when I go to sleep, it takes me, like, four hours. I'm just thinking of everything that I did wrong. Like, like don't you guys go through that? No. Do you take, do you take pills? I or? sleep like a baby. When I, uh... Oh, wait, what was I going to say? I, just, I don't know. Yeah. It was your thought. It was my thought. No, but seriously, I feel bad all the time, and that's how. <laughs> and I have a good life. Oh, I just feel bad. I got it. What, what's ironic about filming our show is that we used to have these terrible jobs and offices. We escaped those, made a TV show, and now we film it in terrible offices. And it feels oh, yeah. terrible There's shooting definitely asbestos in them. They there. look awful. Yeah, the, the, the air we're breathing is bad for us, so it really takes us back to that place. So I think that's how we ground it. What was the hardest part about going into season two? What were you most worried about repeating or not getting the chance to do? I think we didn't want to like go off the rails. I, 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 or like, um, in the sense of like, we didn't want to lose touch with what we initially loved about the show, which was sort of a grounded darkness. Um, and when we were writing, I, I don't think we took it there, but that was at least my fear was like getting too like goofy in a way that took it away from what the show initially was. Um, my fear was just being uncovered for the fraud that I am. You know what I mean? Like, that's always my fear. It's like time hasn't run out yet, but it's coming. So I feel like just getting away with it one more time. Uh, what do you think is going to happen when you're uncovered as the fraud? They're going to trot me out in the middle of the Times Viacom Square. Commons. Oh. You know what I mean? There's a nice grassy knoll, and it's in the middle of Viacom, and they're going to be like, every executive is going to come be like, oh, we actually watched the footage, we read the scripts, and we realized you're not funny, and you actually have to move back and home. And then Kent Alterman will hand you a sword. Yeah. And then oh, I have to commit seppuku. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But it has to be dishonorable. Yeah. What is, is seppuku? That's not... Uh, That's the samurai... Like in the gut. I thought in that was Hari. Uh, it's called something else. Oh, wait. What is it? Is that called? Harikari? Hari, Hari, Harikari, yeah. We should Hari. get off this subject. I feel like three white men talking about this. <laughs> we are way Not off good. base. For scratch good. all you of that. You know what? How about record? this? Yeah. I, I'll just, that I should kill myself. You yeah. know what I mean? Just <laughs> in a nice yeah, old American way. Maybe yeah. they give me a gun. That's an American thing. Yeah. There it is. Um, on that note, Corporate is on Comedy Central. Uh, it's, I think it's the funniest show on TV. It's the darkest, best satire. I love it. There's only a few more episodes left, left of this season's next week, right? Is yeah, at 10 and 10.30 p.m. on Comedy Central next Tuesday uh, are the last two episodes of season two. But you can always watch both seasons at cc.com. Everybody give uh, Jacob Matt a big round of applause. Let's hear it. Thank, Thank you. you.